Uh, so we are in the Santa Cruz River Channel, halfway between uh, Silver Lake and Star Pass Boulevard, um, at the uh, very close to the outfall of the Santa Cruz River Heritage Project. And what a lot of the viewers can probably see now is a very empty stream channel, uh, a lot of gravel and some concrete banks on the side. And that's because we are currently in the area that had the sediment removal done this summer that you probably heard about through the news um, uh, over the last few months. So the area we're standing on right now was actually bulldozed in, on uh, starting about June 5th um, and uh, cleared. They took out, I can't remember how many, a lot, thousands of cubic yards of sediment um, out of the river channel to increase flood capacity. And as you mentioned, the river had been flowing for almost a year but the flow releases got ahead of the maintenance schedule for the sediment removal. And so water was turned off for about six weeks while this happened. And so that's why you see this kind of barren area right here. Um, in a little bit, we'll walk over to where the water is currently being released and you'll see an area that we were able to conserve and prevent from being bulldozed. And that had um, a lot of fun things that we'll, we'll look at in a minute. Much more lush, much more beautiful than the gravel that you see here. And to add just a few things, so this is our first virtual creek walk, and we are amateurs at this stuff. The audio, visual, video stuff. And here comes the army, Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopter. Right on cue. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, Can you hear me, Lauren? Yes. Can, yeah, can we hear yeah, you? Can I get a thumbs up from you? Oh, as it gets louder. Okay. Cool. Yes. Yep. We can hear you. I think the plane so is gone. So we hear that this is flowing. A really nice riparian area started to develop. And of course, they're going to come in here with bulldozers. And uh, Michael was able to convince uh, the powers that be to have a no-touch zone and left some of that riparian vegetation in place. And like Michael said, we'll walk over there in a few minutes, uh, but it, it really is an amazing spot. It's the first time a wetland has sat at the base of a mountain and you can see a mountain right behind us here in over a hundred years. So this whole area was a series of cienegas or marshes or wetlands back 120 years ago and uh, surrounded by farmlands that were irrigated by canals and many of you know the story it's those canals when the Anglos showed up they started expanding that agriculture and then some erosion events happened and basically dewatered this whole area uh, so this is the first step in, in restoring uh, the Santa Cruz River and the, the splendor and the verdancy that, that occurred here 150 years ago so pretty exciting stuff happening here. And I like to qualify it a bit because it is, it is to some degree restoring uh, some of the populations of plants and wetland plants and dragonflies and, and hopefully heal a top minnow soon. But it's, but it's also not restoring because that system, the Sienegas aren't coming back. And the floodplain at that time was a half mile wide and now we're about 200 feet wide because of urban development. And so we're, we're going to recreate that historic habitat to the best we can within the confines of the urban city now. And this is a fluid water. So this is treated sewage water. And it's treated to a really high standard. It's actually, I think, treated to a little bit higher standard than they actually put on the parks and golf courses. Because they know people are going to be down here splashing around in here. So I saw one of your questions, Lauren, is it okay if people come down here and play in this water? It's perfectly okay. I wouldn't drink the water. You're probably not gonna get sick, but it's definitely to the, to the standard of human contact. So encourage people, bring your kids down here. It's a pretty amazing spot. And as the next couple of years go by, uh, we will see a, a much larger expanse of riparian area in here. So the, the recreational opportunities are just gonna expand with time. And the, <clears throat> the spot we'll walk to where the effluent is let out into this marsh um, that we've preserved and, and kind of enhanced to a degree 
that's that's certainly the best place to come in and have contact with the water. As Trevor said, the water is completely contact safe. You shouldn't put your head underwater is what the, the treatment plant says. However, we are in an urban city. And so as this water flows further and further downstream, parts influent from the rest of the city can wash in. And one of the problems we actually have in Tucson is dog waste. And every storm, this dog waste gets washed in through our urban washes, ends up in the river, and you can actually have higher E. coli where that happens. So I always like to promote people picking up after their dogs as much as possible, because this effluent is beautiful water when it comes out of the pipe. And it's only when we get into the city that we start to mess up that beautiful water. And then there's also something that's been weighing on my mind a lot. There's a lot of trash down here. And we get a lot of trash coming in from the city in these tributary arroyos. So uh, you'll see a lot more about trash from, from Watershed Management Group and other groups that are working on this issue. But again, there's trash in the water right now as we walk over there. So yeah, good point, Michael, about that. Uh, 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 the, wa the water in the, in the channel itself. We're in what we call the preservation area of the outfall. And so this, this is an interesting wetland because it was completely unintentional. Nobody planned for this wetland to be here. If the county would have been ahead on their, their blading schedule, their sediment removal schedule, all the sediment, this five feet of sediment below us would be gone. And the water, which is actually hiding behind these cattails, the pipe, would be a, a waterfall going into the channel like you can see at Ina Road and like you could see near Sweetwater, where there's a pipe up high, it falls into the channel. Because the county was behind on their bulldozing schedule, the water came out at grade or at level and onto a floodplain terrace that already had soil and vegetation, which basically gave it a big boost to turning into a wetland. If it just would have fallen onto sand, it'd take a lot longer for a wetland to develop. So nobody planned that, it was just an accident, a lucky accident. And we noticed, you know, within a couple of weeks, wetland vegetation was starting to show up a year ago, June, when the water was turned on. So it quickly became obvious that this was a very important place as far as the biodiversity because of the wetland that developed here. And so when the county finally made their final decision about sediment removal and the timing of it, we strongly argued that this part not be touched in the sediment removal because we already had this wetland that had developed here and these nice plants that had grown here. And so we wanted to preserve that so that when the rest of the channel was bulldozed, this would serve as the seed source for wetland plants to go back into the rest of the channel. So this, this dried up. We turned the water off for six weeks this spring while they were doing the sediment removal. But these cattails and this other vegetation stayed here, went dormant, it looked dead. But as soon as the water was turned back on six weeks later, all the wetland plants were able to come back to life. And so that's why even though it's only been a couple months, these cattails are already 12 or 14 feet tall. Can you say a little bit about the sound we're hearing that is of the water? Yeah, can you hear the water being released? Can you hear a little bit. I, yeah. I think I thought it was the wind, but I think what, what we're hearing is the water. Are you all standing in water or are you just close to it? I am, yep. Trevor's standing in water. Of course Trevor's I'll standing stand in water. In water. And we'll walk more into the water in a minute. <laughs> oh, sure. okay. We're going to get very wet here. <laughs> so I, I, I want to give a shout out to Regional Flood Control because they, they actually listen to Michael. One of their mandates is riparian restoration and and protecting the, the, the few remaining riparian areas we have in Tucson. So just super happy that they, they accommodated this special place, listened to the experts, and left it alone. And also Tucson Water. They, yeah, Tucson, as, Tucson Water deserves a lot of kudos yeah. too for just doing this. As soon as they realized the value of this wetland area, then they, they got behind you know, everything we said about needing to preserve it. So they, it was really a collaborative effort. It was impressive to see different agencies work together so well and so, so quickly. We basically had a day because <laughs> the contractors for the sediment removal, it, it all very quickly and it was a Friday afternoon and Tucson Water said to me, oh, we've got the county plans for where they're going to bulldoze. I looked at those plans on a PDF and I said, oh crap, they're going to bulldoze the marsh, the outfall marsh. 
And Tucson Water said, well, tell me what you want to preserve and we'll send it back to the county and they'll give it to the to the contractors. And, I, and we literally like drew it on a piece of paper, took a picture, sent it back and it miraculously worked out and everybody went along with it. So it was, it was really impressive to see agencies work together so well and benefit. It's interesting because those contractors had just finished a job at Watershed Management Group is to design an installation of a large uh, water harvesting native park, natural park, up at Grant on the Santa Cruz. And they hauled all the sediment in from Grant to Prince into this big pit. And then they actually contoured out our design for us. So the guys who were doing it kind of got where we were coming from. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, and I will, I'll give a shout out to the contractors too, because they gave me their cell phone numbers and they said, anytime we're working around here, we'll text you. You can come down and make sure we're not bulldozing what we're not supposed to. We'll make sure we can help whatever way we can. It was, it was pretty impressive. Not what I'm used to when you deal with people with bulldozers. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it was an incredible um, partnership and, and definitely created a, a beautiful space. Um, and do you all know, we have a question, um, is there any plan to have water flowing in the Rieto? Good question. <laughs> I think the short answer is right now, no. Um, the long answer is we hope so at some point. So the reason that the Heritage Project was so successful and so relatively easy to do is that the pipeline infrastructure was already in place. So the original plan was to pipe this effluent through Tucson and sell it to users or buyers in downtown Tucson. So the pipeline was here. And so Tucson Water was able to do this entire project for less than a million dollars, which is a tiny amount of money when you're talking about infrastructure projects. And so in order to do you know, a lot of reaches of the Rito or other washes in town, you would have to install the pipes, which would then bring the effluent in. So that's the cost starts to get pretty high. But we are looking at some sites along the Tanka Verde because there is a pipeline that goes out the 49er Country Club. And there's a lot of well users that could be switched to affluent along there, as well as potentially supplementing some of the more perennial spots along the Tanka Verde uh, with extra affluent. And I will mention that uh, 15 years ago when the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan was being developed, the city and the county, along with some of the other jurisdictions, got together and designated a conservation of fluid pool of, I can't remember the acre feet, but it's a very significant amount every year that can go to riparian restoration. So I don't think this outfall here is counting against that CEP. So there's still quite a bit of water that could be put on the ground. It does come down to money. But uh, the political will is starting to be there. So I think uh, potentially we could see a lot more fluid uh, jump-started riparian areas in the future. The key to sustainability here in Tucson, though, is all of these wetlands and rivers were groundwater dependent uh, back in the day. And so right now, where we're standing, it's probably 150 to 200 feet to, uh, to groundwater where it used to be five feet to groundwater. Uh, so we have a long ways to come back and the way uh, Watershed Management Group has started prioritizing where we're working is there still are areas in Tucson that have water within 50 to 25 feet of the surface. The upper Tanka Verde, parts of Sienega Creek. Uh, so those are the areas that if we start sinking more water, infiltrating more water through restorative actions, we see a much faster response to those actions. So in downtown Tucson, we're gonna have to use affluent. Uh, we're gonna have to severely curtail our groundwater pumping to bring back that uh, groundwater levels. So we have a long road to, road to hoe, but we, we think we know how to get there. Awesome. Another helicopter. <laughs> right on cue. All right. Well, shall we get to the water? Um, we don't have questions at the moment from our audience. So 
I think um, if you all are okay with it, I'm, I might just grab that hammer and walk in there a bit. I think that's I great. walk through there a lot, so I can yes. manage the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So and it is walk. a little blurry, so definitely okay. holding it steady is, is great. So I'm going to walk you now over into where the water is coming out, which used to be very easy to see. But as you can see now, there's basically nothing but cattails. <laughs> so it gets a lot trickier. I'm going to literally take you through the jungle here. Whoa. <laughs> So now we are in the heart of the project. And can you see the pipe? Yes. Can we see? Can I give thumbs up and nodding heads? Great. Yeah, we can definitely see that. That's incredible. Yeah. So this is where the water is coming out right now. This is uh, 1950 gallons per minute. So about four cubic feet per second of water is coming out. And so that has caused this explosion of growth that you see here. Uh, the water is, is relatively warm. It's stable year-round. It comes out at about 70 degrees. And so that, combined with our sunshine or hot temperatures, make perfect wetland growing conditions. And so we see our cattails here. We see uh, plants like speedwell, which is this flowering plant here. We see desert broom. We see a lot of different plants here. So, I'm going to take you out of here so we can hear you a little bit better. And I'm going to set it up just for a minute and then we'll move over again. Yeah. So uh, we did have a question. Thank you for identifying some of those plants um, that we are seeing, Michael. Um, and so I just wanted to go back. We do have, um, because we knew that it wasn't going to be too detailed um, on the screen, we do have um, a PowerPoint for you all um, that shows some of the plants. So I can just share my screen for a second and show you all what he was talking about. Uh, so he mentioned cattails, which you all can see here. And let me see if I can click present. So those are the cattails that he was talking about. So that's a close-up picture um, of some that we um, have. And then he did mention speedwell as well. So that's a really close-up image of that plant right there. So, and there are quite a few grasses, I believe, Trevor. Um, yeah, and I only recognize one. I only recognize the uh, non-native invasive grass here. Okay. And there's two of those. We've got uh, both uh, quite a bit of buffalo grass in here and then quite a bit of Johnson grass. And as this place gets wetter, it'll lose some of the buffalo grass because it doesn't handle the real saturated soil. But the Johnson grass uh, that is becoming more of a problem in our riparian areas does like the saturated soil. So we could see it take it off too. But there are also some native grasses around here. Yeah. That I'm there's unsure definitely what they are. Plants, so. And then there's plenty of critters flying around. So Michael yeah, I was has. Gonna say, what do we Michael have? Michael has one in his hand here. This will be really difficult to see with the screen. Let me see here. Can anyone see what I'm holding? I can see it a little bit. <laughs> holding it in front of something dark might be a little better. You are now off the screen with your hand. Yeah. Okay. It is definitely a little blurry. We have a guess, uh -huh. um, a mayfly. Good guess. So it is, um, it is super tiny. It is almost mayfly size, but this is actually our smallest damselfly that we have mm -hmm. here. It's called a citrine forktail, and it's only about uh, 19 millimeters. I forget how many inches that is. A half inch, you know, three quarters of an inch. Very small. Yeah, and it's, it's actually one of the first species that shows up in places like this because it's so light that it gets carried by the wind. And so it can colonize new volcanic islands pretty quickly, um, things like that. So this is one of the ones that showed up the first day of flow releases and colonized quickly and has been here 
was here through the last 10 months and then they turned the water off, it disappeared and it came back immediately when we turned the water back on. So that's a small critter. And then I've got a bigger one in the net. I'm gonna to try to get here while. And we do have some close up images of some of the, the different insects and, and particularly dragonflies. Um, as we have the dragonfly guy with us today. Um, so if, if it's one of the images that I have on that PowerPoint, we'll definitely show you all again as well. Um, and there are great resources for uh, damsel and, and dragonfly identification, both on the internet and a great book about the uh, dragonflies and damselflies of Arizona. Uh, yeah. Ooh, so fantastic book by an author called uh, Rich Bailowitz and Doug Danforth. It's a guidebook that came out a couple of years ago, right? And it's it's fantastic. So here is one of our more common dragonflies. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah, that's huge. Can everybody can I have a thumbs up and or something from everybody that can see? Yeah, you guys can see him or her. Her, yeah. So her. That's, okay. This is actually the, you can't see a whole lot of color probably in this. Let me see if I can turn and get the, the um, light on it a little bit better. Let's see if we turn the angle. You're off the screen, there we go. Okay, can people see the color of it now? A little bit, I can kind of see that it's, uh, it's like brownish maybe? Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit of a brownish tan color. So the females of dragonflies and damselflies are often pretty dull colored like this. Um, this is actually a roseate skimmer. Woo, got a little tilty. Uh, a roseate skimmer, which you should have the male of in your PowerPoint slide. So if you wanna show that. Yes, I can definitely do that. Can you repeat the name of that really quickly as well? Yeah, it's the roseate skimmer. So it's our most tropical, wild-looking dragonfly that we have here. Sort. There we go. There we go. We're having issues with the, our gimbal here, and the gimbal's supposed to be holding this phone steady for us, and it, it's, I think it's not like in the heat out here. <laughs> so that's, that's probably our most colorful dragonfly we have around here, a neon, it looks like a flying, a neon pink tube of lipstick and so the, what I just showed you is the female of that which is a pretty dull color but this is one of the most common species we have here in the marsh um, so it's definitely a good one to come down here and see. You can watch them through binoculars uh, there's enough of them here you could just walk up and see them pretty easily um, mm -hmm. or if you have a camera you can do that too. Yeah. And definitely, um, we did have a suggestion to hold it up against your, your shirt. Oh, he's going to stay there. She's going to stay there. Wow. And that's a good, um, definitely a, a better image as well, if you all can see that. And I saw a question on there about the difference between a dragonfly and a damselfly, I think. Is that a question I saw pop up? Yes. That was the next thing I was going <laughs> to ask. This is a perfect way to illustrate that question. So dragonflies hold their wings out flat like that when they're at rest, like this dragonfly is doing right here. Whereas damselflies hold their wings tight and against their abdomen backwards like that. So, and they're often, you know, most of the time that's a size difference as well. Dragonflies, as you can see here, this is about an average size dragonfly and it's much bigger than the damselfly that I showed you a little while ago. And Michael, are they sexually dimorphic for the same reason they think birds are? Right. So the males have to attract females. The so males, they get the gaudy colors. Exactly. The males both attract females and most species, the males will also defend a territory and fight other males that come near it. Usually males of the same species, but some um, species are so aggressive, they'll fight any dragonfly male that comes nice. near them. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully we'll let her see if she wants to fly along yet. There she goes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Definitely something if you all decide to to go out to this area on your own, definitely something to to look for. I don't know if you'll be able to catch them like Michael can, but uh, <laughs> I suppose you could try. <laughs> you can. So a really inexpensive net, you know, that you could find at a, at a, a pet store or something like that. This is good enough. When the densities are high, like they are here, this is a very productive site. And it's pretty easy to just kind of sweep through the grass and see what you get. 
and usually I'll hold my net like this and then you'll see them flying around in here. So then I reach in carefully, grab them by the wings so they can't fly away or damage themselves and then I can tell what species I have. But here they're so abundant that you can literally walk up within a foot of most of these dragonflies and damselflies and just see them with your own eye and identify them if you use um, a guide or if you use iNaturalist or something like that. Yeah. And you've done, you've done dragonfly studies. Correct. correct. Did you do yeah. one on the Santa Cruz Heritage Project? Yeah, in fact, it's a study that we're hoping will be published next week. So we've, we've awesome. moved really fast for scientific publications. Wow. Yeah. Usually they take multiple years before you get them out, but we, we were racing with the, with the Heritage Project and Dragonflies because we wanted to show how positive this kind of uh, project is for biodiversity. Um, so I should see the, what they call the proofs when they typeset the scientific paper. I should see that this week and then hopefully by next week that, that will be released. And what journal is that going to be in? It's called Peer J, yeah. and it's one that anyone in the world can access. You don't have to have a subscription to the journal. So, so we'll definitely link to that uh, journal article when it comes out. That's yes. exciting. And how do you spell that? Put that in the chat for everybody if they're interested. Uh, Peer J. Peer, yeah, Peer as in your peers, and okay. then just a big J. There we go. All right. Well, thank you. That's very exciting, and we'll definitely um, be on the lookout for that. So, great. If you want, if you want now, we can walk you into a different part of the marsh that is actually part that we designed for uh, the sediment removal. As, as it's, it's a long story, but the short version is: before sediment removal, there were a couple of large tamarisk trees that were holding this whole wetland in place and keeping the channel from eroding, and so we. We knew that those tamarisk trees were gonna be removed uh, for flood control and because they're non-native. So we had to come up with a way to keep this wetland from eroding once those strong roots were taken out. And so we actually spent some time and dug some channels to turn the wetland into more of a delta. And so we spread the water out further than it had been before so that none of those individual channels cause such vast erosion and head cuts towards that outfall I just showed you. And so okay. one of the areas, we actually designed a big open wetland where water would flow into it, fill kind of a pond, and then flow out in two different directions. So we can walk over there. The plants are a little different. It yeah. looks different. Yeah. It's a neat spot. Yeah, that was actually one of our questions was, is there invasive species management? So thank you for, for mentioning that. Is there plans in the future? Uh, for there, invasive species management, do you know? Yeah, there's there's a lot of ideas and hope. Um, there's no budget for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what we're trying to do is just through the design of this project and through the way we manage the water, we're trying to encourage the native species to persist. We'll actually go through here. Okay. Take you into the jungle again here. Okay. They're walking through the water, everybody. That's what we can see. How, how high up does the water go? Right now the water is about a foot and a half deep here. And the, the deepest part of the pond we designed is about two feet deep. And if I fall down, WMG's replacing my camera. My phone, I mean. No comment. Oh. Hello. Hello. I'm having <laughs> trouble with the gimbal again. So I've been That's practicing okay. with this darn phone system, this darn camera system for a week now, but it's not cooperating. Well, that still looks really good. So are we, yeah. are we in the middle of the we constructed are. water? Okay. Exactly. So Part of where we just walked through was a channel that we dug when this was all dry we dug into the dirt and then there are a couple other feeder channels a little bit above where we walked in all of this then is feeding into if you were here six weeks ago or if you were on the loop at that time you would have seen a big expanse of open water here it was just a big pond but since then 
the vegetation is really grown in and it's a diverse vegetation as you can see there's a lot of uh, a lot of this really fine plant material called pondweed or duckweed you can see that there and that's a, a floating aquatic plant so that's covering a lot of the open water and then there's the speed well that's right where trevor's at that's the speed Sorry, well. I have some images of those as well, if my PowerPoint would work. <laughs> That's there a speed well that... Is this the Johnson grass right here? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Are you going to share the PowerPoint or should we keep chatting? You all can keep chatting and I will share the PowerPoint at the same so time. So how many species of each of the orders have you, or not orders, the damselflies and those? So there's so the duckweed for you all, as you can see. Yeah, good close and up. Then, have you mentioned the marsh purslane? No, but we do have nut some sedge. Here too. Yeah. Yep, nut sedge. Let's see. There's a bunch of this. Both on the other side. Yeah. We mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. saw that. So, awesome. So those are just close up images of the plants that they are seeing. Um, and definitely getting out there and experiencing them yourself would be um, a great opportunity as well. So I can stop sharing. So what, what you're basically seeing here is kind of an ecological succession. Right? We started with a blank slate when we had just dirt and water and some plants moved in quickly, some species moved in quickly. And now some of the slower growers like the cattails um, are starting to pop up in the background here just behind uh, Trevor. And so we're expecting over the next year that a lot of this will close in with those cattails and different plants will pop in here. Um, it's part of the reason for trying to create variation in what the marsh looks like in depth, water depth and vegetation is to create variation for species, animal species to occupy, which Trevor had just asked you know, a good question, which is how many dragonflies do you see here, right? And we have that information from the day the water was turned on and June 24th, 2019. So that first day that water was on, there were actually seven species of dragonflies and damselflies that managed to find the water within hours of it being turned on. So I like to say the species were hungry for the water. <laughs> and then over the course of the 10 months that the water was on before the sediment removal project started, uh, we got a total of 41 species of dragonflies and damselflies here. So it was, it was a pretty remarkable response um, to the biodiversity that we saw. That's awesome. And I have seen um, some things on Twitter. I believe I saw a video of a coyote and um, a roadrunner running around right. um, as well from, from you. So definitely yeah, that's, a lot more than that's, insects that's, over there. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. thing about this is that some of the species we think of as being purely desert species we're not needing water, things like roadrunners benefit enormously from the water being here. Um, a lot of predatory birds actually have a pretty high water demand. They get really thirsty from all that animal flesh they're eating. And uh, so we see it there, it's not uncommon that I'll be down here uh, on a hot morning and I'll see eight or nine roadrunners at the same time all drinking water. I've seen six red tail hawks at the same time down here, all drinking water. So especially when you come down here in June or, you know, unfortunately this year, all the way through August, when there's no rains and there's not a lot of other moisture, a lot of these desert animals will come down here and drink much more than you would think otherwise. And the other, the other very cool thing about Tucson is we have a really high diversity of toads so in the Tucson corridor is like that super highway for toads around here. And before we only ever found them, we used to run these toad night uh, call chains. At, after the second monsoon, we'd start calling everybody, we're gonna go out and find toads because we're nerds. Uh, but you could find seven species of toads in the outfalls where all the uh, urban arroyos dump into the uh, Santa Cruz. Well, now they have a permanent source of water. So the critters like uh, are two that are not monsoon responsive, the red spotted toad and the Sonoran desert toad now have a permanent oasis here 
on the river, but then also just gives extra to those other species that are more monsoon uh, responsive, such as the uh, two spadefoots, the couches and the Mexican spadefoot, and the uh, Great Plains toad, and then some very rare critters like uh, there's a, a can uh, not a canyon tree frog, but a burrowing tree frog that actually operates much like a toad uh, that is found down here. And then the Sonoran toad, Sonoran green toad, I think it is, and one more Woodhouse's narrow, toad. Yeah, narrow mouth, I think they got in West Branch. Yeah, and then the narrow mouth toad right over here on the other side. So the, the toads definitely responded quickly. Um, this year, as, as Trevor mentioned, they don't need, some of them don't need to wait for rain. And so within four days of water being turned on this year after the sediment removal, there were Sonoran Desert toads that were breeding here. Those tadpoles have already developed and those toadlets have already left the water. And there's already a second generation of Sonoran Desert toads that have bred here just since the beginning of June. And about a couple weeks after that, we started to see both the red spotted toads that Trevor mentioned and the Great Plains toads. And as of yesterday, when I was down here, you could start to see the red spotted toad lets the tiny little toads emerging out of the water and hopping around. So anytime over the next month will be a good time to come down and see baby toads along the Heritage Project. And right now is like a great time to get out of your house and to come down here because you're, we're seeing a lot of insect activity. And then as it's getting darker and darker, that's when you're gonna start seeing the toad activity. So bring your headlamps down here and you won't believe what you'll see down here. I do see two way little step. blue guys right there. And really the only <laughs> little blue damselfly I know is the Sabino dancer, because it's a very rare species. It's only known for a few places in the Sky Island region. I don't think that's it, but it looked like it. To my untrained, I'm a herpetologist. <laughs> so those of you who start to get interested in dragonflies and damselflies will uh, eventually find the blue damselflies to be one of your nightmares. <laughs> <Because Why's that? laughs> there, there is not, they're kind of like the little brown jobs of the bird land. There is not unfortunately just the Sabino damselfly, that would be fantastic. Uh, but there's probably 15 species of blue damselflies around here. <laughs> Uh, so I'll see if I can get yeah. enough you here. Hold that up maybe against your dark shirt or your water bottle. Mm. Mm. Is it focusing at all? Of, we can kind of see the little blue. Um, you could try your hand again as well. Ooh. Yeah, let me try here. And there are a bunch of those little ones, and then the brown ones must be the females. <laughs> off it's males here. It. See if I can get another one. And I don't believe we had an image of that one on our PowerPoint slides. Or did you send me one, Michael? Uh, there should be for the familial bluet. Yes. Yes, I do remember that name. So I will pull that <laughs> up quickly for you all as well as he tries to catch another one for us. And then I have a question for Michael after he's done showing this guy off. Great. There's a ton and of spiders in here. <laughs> little like fishing spiders, but I don't know if they're actually truly fishing spiders. There's also a question on. for you, Trevor, maybe. Um, will cattails eventually overwhelm this pond area similar to the sweetwater wetlands? And it goes, it goes back to when we were talking about cat, cattails. It definitely could, but that was the idea with some of the varying depths of flow channels and ponding areas to try to uh, to preclude that from happening, but they're very aggressive. And so they could take over large portions of this. And then just like Pima County has to do at Sweetwater, uh, it's they're pretty easy to control. Yeah. So that's a bigger image. Thank you, Trevor, for answering that question. Um, this is a bigger image of that familial bluet that Michael was talking about. And it looks like he might have another one for us. Yep. So I will stop sharing my screen. Maybe behind the phone. See it a little bit better, I think, this yeah. time around. You can see those little black stripes, maybe, for yep. green wall. And it's, it's, you can tell it's quite a bit larger than that first um, damselfly I showed you, which was very small. You want to so bring it a little was, closer, Michael? Yeah. This one's about it. You guys see a, those stripes a little bit? Yeah, yep. I'm seeing some nods. So we'll, we'll be professional damselfly and dragonfly identifiers by the end of this. 
Exactly. Yeah. And so the, the damselfly is, it holds its wings exactly as I pinned the wings. Mm. So this is how it, at rest, it holds its wings back and behind its body like this. They're very quick to fly. So we'll see if it'll perch for a second. No, no, no. You let the other one go and it flapped. Oh, there we go. And it's gone. <laughs> yeah. The other advantage too that we have that Sweetwater doesn't have is we have floods here. Mm. And so the periodic flooding that happens in the river will knock out patches of cattails as they grow and create those open spots. And so what we hope to see eventually is a mosaic down here where there's areas that get washed out by the monsoons and that's open water and then areas where it's less impacted by floods and the cattails can take over there. This is a good thing that Trevor just found. Whoa, what is that? Yeah, so this is, the technical name is an exuvium and I'm trying to get it so that it's in focus. Bring it over to, uh, I think it's my, my right, yes. You all can kind of see, looks almost, it's like light brown or a little bit translucent for you all. Yeah, yeah. And so this is actually the shed larval skin of a dragonfly. Wow. So this, this is showing one of the, the initial generations of dragonflies that's grown up here since the water was turned back on. So this would be a very large dragonfly, a common green darner. It's about that big as an adult, uh, blue and green. So those flew in here early on, laid eggs. That larvae grew in here, grew really rapidly because it's such a wonderful, productive environment. And it went through its whole larval cycle and then emerged out into another adult stage. So in cold water, that can take a whole year or longer, but here where it's warm water and it's productive, that can happen in as fast as a couple of months, which is what we saw here. So just so people know that larval stage of these guys are aquatic critters, they're down underneath the water, they're feeding on smaller insects, they're feeding on detritus. I'm guessing they're eating plant matter, roots. Mostly, mostly other insects. Mostly, <laughs> other, okay, so they're, they're predators. They're predators all okay. the way through. Okay. Both the, yeah. the larvae are predators, the larvae will eat mosquito larvae, and the adult dragonflies will eat adult mosquitoes. So we like them both in the water and out of the water. Right, right. Yeah, that sounds good to me too. Um, Definitely like dragonflies more than I like mosquitoes, but maybe that's just me. Um, and we do have a question. So uh, will there be frogs as well as toads that, that come to this marsh? I think we, we may have touched on this a little bit, but will they, will they come into the, the marsh area? Yeah, so right now there is a frog living here. <laughs> there, um, there are a lot of places in Tucson, like golf courses and ponds that are home to bullfrogs, which are non-native species. And last year, it took about three months for the bullfrogs to move from somewhere else in the city to find the heritage project, but they eventually did. And they, they started to get fairly abundant here. We turned off the water that knocked them back, that got, got rid of all of them, but it seemed like one or two that managed mm -hmm. to stick around through the dry period. And so when we turn the water back on, they're out hopping around. Um, that's not an ideal species to have here, but it's also one that's, um, at this point, it's, it's, we're gonna live with it, right? It's almost impossible to control at this scale. And so, so definitely bullfrogs. We would love to see lowland leopard frogs, our native frog. They were here when Trevor was describing this place as a cienega 100 years ago. We have records of lowland leopard frogs from this exact spot. So that's a species we would love to see return to the river, mm -hmm. um, but it's gonna have to compete with the bullfrogs. Yeah. And they and don't I, yeah. do real well in with bullfrogs, you know, and the issue is, so we discussed earlier this year about putting in some grants to get rid of all the non-native vertebrate species in the Santa Cruz. And we all got together and we decided that the source populations between all the urban ponds and then everything upstream of us in the mountains in Mexico, there's bullfrogs, there's non-native fish. And so it's a really big problem. So managing it at this small scale is going to be our only choice in this. So Michael's down here monitoring this, uh, reporting these. If the bullfrogs start get out of control, there is a dedicated group of uh, folks, both volunteers in U of A, Game and Fish and Fish and Wildlife Service that have been doing bullfrog eradication very uh, successfully in some other watersheds. So maybe dealing with it at a small scale, 
I will mention that a lowland leopard frog did show up at uh, Mission Gardens recently. Mm -hmm. So where that came from, we really don't have any idea. Uh, there are some captive populations, but not very many. And kind of the native populations are up in the Catalinas and in the Rincons. And there are no lowland leopard frogs south of us upstream, so they didn't wash in because all the leopard frogs upstream of us outside the Tucson Basin are Chiricahua leopard frogs. So how it got to Mission Garden, it's a mystery, but hopefully they'll make it here too. I, hope I wanted so. to ask about some of the other insects uh, uh, and arachnids. Uh, do you know what these little spiders are? Are they actually fishing spiders? They, the ones that we see right now aren't fishing spiders per se, but fishing spiders were here last year. They okay. did show up. So I'm expecting them to show up again now cool. that the water has been flowing. But spiders are one of the, you know, maybe folks don't want to hear this if they don't like spiders, but <laughs> spiders are one of the main beneficiaries of aquatic insects. So when things like a mayfly or a damselfly emerges out of the water as a larva and turns into a, an adult that has wings, the spiders are there waiting. And so they've got their webs all over the place. You could find webs around this area that are just covered in mayflies, right? So spiders love it. They do really well with uh, all the insect prey. Here we have, I think, a little native cockroach. Yep. <laughs> a little native cro cockroach crawling up my leg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other insects that I love are the stinging and biting insects that live in the water. And two of my favorite critters are toe biters, and I can't remember the, the real name, and then the Dobson fly larvae. Right. So toe biters we have here, the giant water bugs, the bell stomatidae. Yeah, uh, we've seen two different species of those here that have come back. Um, we haven't seen the Dobson flies. They, they tend to like um, places that have connection with groundwater. Dobson flies will actually spend some of their time down underneath the gravel. And so my guess is we probably won't see Dobson flies come back here. That might be one of the historic species that we could only restore if we had connection to groundwater. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I did, you know, go ahead. Sorry. I did post that um, article that Trevor had sent to me earlier today about uh, Gila top minnow. So do you all want to talk about that and, and if we might see fish in this area as well? That's, that's the plan. So there's been a lot of work behind the scenes very quietly the last several months um, because anything you do with an endangered species is controversial, right? And there was, there was hesitancy for a long time about the idea of having Gila Top Minnow downtown because of these management issues, because of sediment removal, because of the uncertainty of how long the water will be flowing, things like that. Um, luckily, some things happened last spring and it kind of forced some conversations among me, Fish and Wildlife Service, Arizona Game and Fish, Sonoran Institute, Tucson Water, and Pima County with a lot of different management people all together in a room. And, and due to that situation, we kind of got past that political hurdle and the city started to understand that they could use this thing called a safe harbor agreement, which the article talks about, that as, as Doug Duncan from Fish and Wildlife Service describes, is a get out of jail free card. So if you have an endangered species in your water, this is Tucson Water's water, they own this water that's flowing here, if they do something that accidentally kills the fish, like turn off the water, like do sediment removal, then they don't suffer any kind of legal liability for that. And so that's, that has been quietly happening behind the scenes. It got through the mayor, the city council, everything else. And finally now is we're able to say it publicly. And now it's up to Game and Fish because they manage the actual fish, the actual individual fish to find enough fish from the right genetic stock get those together and then we'll stock them hopefully this fall down here. And it's important that they're doing this type of work and moving these fish around. Uh, it's safeguarding against catastrophic events. So you can't have all your fish in one basket in case something really bad happens to that basket. And what we think there was 200 years ago, these riparian areas, these wetlands were connected either by just storm flows and but there was a lot more groundwater supported riparian areas and so these fish could get a lot around a lot more now they've been isolated 
And so the genetics of these guys are super important to look at. So you want to know from what source population, did these come from Sienega Creek? Did they come from Sabino? Did they come from some source population in Mexico or down in the San Rafael Valley or another place? And they have to keep track of this. So it'll be interesting to see. I forget where the source population for the, the top minnow that they put into Mission Garden. Yeah, I believe that's Santa Cruz headwaters, but I'm or, not certain. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they'll probably want to use those same type of fish, but they may have a population, a much smaller population of a less uh, of a more far flung population that they want to put in here. And then if something's going to happen, we uh, and they can come down here and harvest fish out of here, move them into another spot or move them into a more protected area. It'll be so interesting to see putting fish in here right before next year's monsoon. Then we get floods in here. Those top minnows, will they end up in Marana in the affluent dominated stretch of, of in Marana? They're finding them there, but uh, you know, doing the genetics, it'll be interesting to see will they make it all the way up there. And then there are also top minnow populations, natural populations in the headwaters of the Santa Cruz River. So might we see some of those getting flushed in here, along with some of the non-natives, of course. Mm -hmm. But our little native fish are much tougher than most of our non-native fish and can live in these very shallow, flashy systems. So it'll be interesting to watch this uh, happen over the next couple of years. Yeah. I was also super excited to see that you had a checkered garter snake already down here. Yeah, yeah, so that's a native species that got here on its own, the checkered garter snake. Um, unlike a fish, it can move over land. It doesn't need water and in fact spends part of its life on land. And so there have been records even, you know, say 15 years ago when this was bone dry, there were occasional sightings where a garter snake would go through downtown, probably getting from one watered place to a different watered place. Uh, but now they've set up shops, they're breeding here. I've seen large ones, I've seen juveniles, you know, they, it took them about five months to find the water, but they did and they, they moved in as soon as they found it. So it's, it's nice to see. So we probably won't see our other two species of garter snakes because again, they're much more aquatic. They need those connected systems. However, they could arrive with floodwaters coming out because they are both the Mexican garter snakes and uh, the black neck garter snake in the upper watershed. So it's just fantastic that Michael's here monitoring this and can inform us. I wish I could come down here every day, but Catla won't pay me to do that. So here I am. I saw um, a lot of questions popping up, so. Yes, so speaking of monitoring this area, we have a few uh, unrelated questions, uh, unrelated to each other, but um, how far downstream does this water flow go? That's a good question. So. The original plan was to have this water flowing at the volume you saw today, which is, you know, roughly 2,000 gallons per minute. That amount of flow, the models, the hydrology models said would get us to about Congress Street, right, which is about a mile or so. When they actually turned on the water last year, turns out models aren't always correct, right? As the, the saying goes, all models are wrong, some models are useful. <laughs> and this one was Same. wrong <laughs> and and the water flowed almost to grant so all the way past congress past speedway almost to grant that was wonderful news for people who like seeing water in the river wonderful news for a lot of us the challenge comes again this is not the natural channel that it was before i mentioned at the beginning this was a wide floodplain right half mile wide the floodplain what Tucson did when it was a growing city in the 30s and 40s and needed to build a freeway and needed to build buildings downtown and the river had already dried up, it mined that floodplain and it dug out sand and gravel from that floodplain on either side of us here in order to build the freeway and build the city. That's great. But then what do we do with the big hole in the ground if it's 1940? We throw all of our trash into it, right? So we have what are essentially buried landfills in several places downtown that go as far as 40 feet below the surface. Because it's the 1940s and 50s, there's mercury in there, there's a number of things, we don't even know actually what's all in there, right? So we don't want that water to come in contact or that landfill to come in contact with any of this water. So the problem was with that high flow of release for a long period of time, 
the aquifer actually responded really quickly right here because of a mountain, because there's lava rock right below the surface here. And so the, the groundwater levels right here went from, as Trevor said, being about 150, 180 feet below the surface to getting as close as 50 feet from the surface. And it happened in a very fast amount of time. That would be wonderful if we were able to restore perennial flows here and restore groundwater connections. But as soon as we got to 50 feet, we almost started wetting the bottom of those landfills. And so Tucson Water had to, because of their permits from the state, they were required to turn down the amount of water, let the aquifer drop down a little bit. And so at that lower level that keeps those landfills dry and keeps stuff from leaching out of those landfills, the water flows to roughly Congress a little bit past, depending on how hot it is outside. Right now it's at full blast. Again, another experiment to see how far the water will flow. It's flowing all the way to past Speedway like we thought. But as I learned yesterday from Tucson Water, the aquifer is raging and ramping back up and we're approaching towards those landfills again. And so probably starting September 1st, they'll have to turn the water back down and it will only reach Congress Street or Cushing Street. So that, that unfortunately for right now, that seems to be the most sustainable flow that we can have down here. There are other options. There's other places that they could release effluent. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to release effluent at Speedway and create a reach that doesn't content, that doesn't mix with these, uh, these uh, landfills here. Um, so at, at some point in the future, you may see water flowing further, but right now we're kind of only guaranteed to flow it from here into Congress Street. Yeah, and that's one of the really big constraints when we talk about restoring groundwater levels to support riparian corridor here in downtown Tucson. We have to deal with these landfills and we have really imperfect knowledge, like Michael said, about what's underground, even where they all are, because there are actually neighborhood uh, landfills that neighborhoods used prior to the 1940s that we have no idea what they were dumping in or where they are. So uh, you, you may have read when they started taking the sediment out of here, they're dumping it on the A Mountain landfill right here adjacent to A Mountain and Mission Garden. And the hope of the neighbors and the Friends of Tucson's birthplace was actually cap that landfill and put a nature park on top of it. But the Rio Nuevo folks envision that as a great place to put a big building and sell office space or put a hotel and shops and stuff in there. So there's a lot of back and forth about what's going on. If they do want to build on there, they have to get in there and remediate that uh, landfill. If we leave it capped and just as a natural park, that's great, but it really precludes what we're gonna be doing in 50 years when we do have rising water levels and hopefully our entire system. So it's gonna be a big expensive project in the future to deal with these. And it isn't just right here in downtown, along the Rito and along the Pantano, there's quite a few of these issues too. Yeah, awesome. And then uh, another question that we had is, uh, is the released wastewater nutrient loaded and inadvertently helping plant growth? Um, or is it closer to rainwater quality? It, it's somewhere in between those two things. So if, if you would have um, looked at the nutrients in the effluent prior to 2013, when the wastewater treatment plants uh, were not upgraded yet, there was a big push in a multi-million, I, I wanna say probably close to $100 million for both of the, the wastewater treatment plants to be upgraded in 2012 and 2013. So prior to that, there was a lot of nutrients coming into the system further north from where we're at now. Those upgrades basically solved the nutrient problem, the nutrient overloading problem. Um, we occasionally will see a little bit too much ammonium coming out of the plants, um, but it will be a real short period and then they'll get it figured out and they'll go back down. So there, it's not creating an ecological problem in that where you get this, this explosion of growth and then that dies off and it sucks up all the oxygen. There's, there's all kinds of problems with high nutrients. We're not seeing that. We're not seeing any toxicity of ammonia that would have killed the fish before, but we don't have that problem anymore. However, the levels are still higher than they would be if you went out and measured them in Stanica Creek or Sabino Canyon. So it's not rainwater, but it's not nasty water. <laughs> and, and really for this kind of project, it's the ideal situation. 
because it's, it's warm water. It's got a little bit of nutrients, but not too much to overload the system. And it can create, you know, wonderful growth, but not explosive growth. Awesome. And um, as, as we have more questions, definitely put those in the, in the chat. But as we uh, wrap up, we've got about uh, 14 minutes left here. So I wanted to ask you all, um, you, Trevor and, and Michael, uh, what do you think uh, this area is going to look like in the next like 10 to, to 50 years? And what, what do you all hope for, for projects like this? Well, you mentioned well, it a little bit, actually, but... Put, you should have put in our vision illustration <laughs> in the PowerPoint, and that's my answer. But we have a long road to go to get there. Uh, I think what's going to happen is this uh, riparian vegetation is going to start following the water as it goes down into the newly formed channel, the newly excavated channel, and it's just going to get thicker and thicker and thicker. And then the really real story is the storms next year. And does the Santa Cruz River just come in here and rip it all out? We'll just have to see. This is a very dynamic system, always has been, always will be. Everybody's seen the pictures of the floodwaters up to the loop. So we just don't know what this could look like. Uh, so we'll just have to keep, a, keep an eye on it, keep coming down here and visiting, encouraging everybody else in Tucson to come out here and discover this spot. Yeah, and I, I think pretty much what we're seeing right here in the Outfall Marsh is kind of what I think is the best case scenario, exactly what Trevor described. When we designed this preservation area and this marsh, the idea was after all that sediment was removed, this would be the seed source. And these plants, these cattails would send out seeds, would send out little propagules, little plantings, and repopulate the area that has been bulldozed. Now, what will happen and what would be ideal in an ecological sense is that eventually things like willows will find this place. Willow seeds will be carried in. Perhaps even cottonwood seeds will be carried in. Those things from an ecological sense are fantastic and we would love to see that in a broader vision. The reality is flood control is in charge of the channel and they have a lot of liability issues with this development along the banks. And so we won't see we won't, the, the county and other managers won't allow a kind of a dense forest to develop here as it might want to do otherwise. And so what we're seeing here, the county and flood control people are very happy with because all of this stuff will lay down in those floods and it won't reduce the capacity of the flood channel. Whereas if you were to fill all this with cottonwood trees, then suddenly every single flood we'd have would go over the banks and into the city. So it's a tricky balance. It's a, it's a managed ecosystem. And I think wetland vegetation like we're seeing here provides a lot of ecological service, but it still doesn't cause too much in the way of flood risk. So that's kind of what my best case scenario is. Right. Yeah, I see this as an area where we can learn and we can demonstrate what can happen when you add water in the desert and how fast it comes back, because it is really amazing. And then, like I mentioned, there are areas in the Tucson Basin where true restoration can work and take hold and grow cottonwood willow gallery forests that are so thick you can't even get through them. And so using these areas, easy access, the kids can come down here and splash around. This is inspirational for the work that everybody is doing in the whole region around these issues. So I, this is just fantastic. And yeah, I hope we get a riparian, little riparian forest all the way, maybe not a riparian forest, a riparian plant community, a very bendy plants going all the way to Congress. And that would be fantastic. And if, if you want, Lauren, we can, uh, if you have questions, we can answer now. Otherwise we can walk to the end of the preservation area and show you where that's already happening, where this yeah, growth that has happened here is starting to spread out into the bulldoze channel. And it's starting to turn that bulldoze gravel into a green jungle. We do have two more questions, um, but it would be also great to, to see that. Um, so Michael, what do you think uh, are the possibilities for removing or remediating these old landfills that you mentioned in this section of the Santa Cruz? Money. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, I saw one estimate for one landfill and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 million just to do a single landfill. And there's multiple landfills and as Trevor said we don't know where all of them necessarily are so you know if George Soros or somebody 
you know, Jeff Bezos wants to give Tucson a billion dollars, we could get rid of every one of these landfills, but, but we need to find that money first. There's, there's ways we could do it. You know, we know where the closest ones are to the riverbed. We could kind of target those. We could be strategic about which landfills we rehabilitate first. So I think it's possible, but it's, it's money. Yeah, there's an interesting uh, uh, movement happening in France. And France is looking at reclaiming its coastlines from development, replanting uh, either sand dunes or mangrove swamps, depending north or south, to protect their coastlines from storm surges. They're going to end up buying 500-year-old houses. <coughs> Somebody just flew in my throat. <laughs> They're going to end up buying, you know, thousand-year-old villages and having to move them in 20 miles inland. So there's all kinds of crazy high in the sky ideas out there. Uh, like Michael mentioned, the floodplain here used to be three or four times larger than the channel is now. We'll never get that floodplain back. There's Tucson City Jails right there, Pima County uh, Services right here. There's a bunch of private houses right here on this side. Uh, there's roadways everywhere. So we have a, you know, to restore the river in downtown Tucson, it's going to take a lot of work. It's so a 500-year project. That's the 500-year plan.